my name is Dana Oldman. I'm the Client Relations Manager for Community Outreach and the Account Manager for our Corporate Training Department at JVS, Jewish Vocational Service located in East Orange in Montclair. JVS was founded in 1939. Our motto at JVS has always been helping people help themselves, which means that we help people get jobs and get back on their feet. Our job seekers programs are fully funded by Jewish Federation of Metro West and by the Helen Kozlowski Foundation in memory of Helen Kozlowski, and we thank them both so much for their support. We're very happy to have John Hadley here with us today to talk about using stories to get hired. John coaches job seekers on strategies and skills to tap into the hidden job market and land the job and pay that they deserve. He also works with professionals struggling to advance in their careers. His career tip newsletter brings expert advice on marketing yourself to over 9,000 subscribers. Um, John, I'm going to turn the program over to you. Welcome. So let me tell you about my friend, John. He had um, been a customer service manager at one of the larger insurance companies. And then they had a um, layoff. So his wife was a programmer. She was making significantly more than he was. So he said, perfect chance to do what I've always wanted to do. They had three young boys. He wanted to be the house husband raising the kids. So that's what he did for the next five, six years. So then he calls me up and he says, who is going to ever hire me back for the sort of role that I'm, I'm really uh, capable of? given what I've been doing. I said, clear your calendar tomorrow, coming up, sat down, worked through his, his resume, his talking points, but most importantly, we worked on his story, his authentic story for what it was that he had done to take charge of his life and do what he always wanted to do and, and what he'd been doing in those years and now what he was ready to do going forward. And he thought about it for a minute and said, yeah, well, yeah, what you've just said, that, that really does feel like me. And suddenly he had the confidence to go out and talk to people about what he'd been doing and what he was looking to do. And within a very short time, he landed as the um, kind of investment manager in a bank and soon after progressed to branch manager of the bank. So stories are really important, both for confidence building and for expressing what you bring to the table to get people really engaged. So here's my agenda for today. I'm gonna to do a quick self-assessment, just have a couple of questions I want you to rate yourself on. Um, we're gonna talk about the psychology of storytelling. And then we're gonna get into two specific types of stories, what I call the hero story, and then to care stories. Um, and then depending on how the time is, uh, you know, we'll just go into Q and A on whatever else, anything about this or anything else about the job search process that you're struggling with. So I want you to rate yourself from one to 10, honestly, I'm not gonna ask you to share your results with me or anyone else. So be really honest with yourself. So number one, I have a unique selling proposition that distinguishes me from other candidates. Number two, I deliver that proposition confidently early in every interview. Three, I have 20 or more concise, compelling, results-oriented accomplishment stories. And four, I work a story seamlessly into every answer I give to an interview question. So any of these, if you rated it um, below a four, you need help. You need help right now. You need to go, you need to talk to Dan, Dana or you need to hire a coach or you need to get a book. You need to do something to fix that. If you rated it, say, a four to a seven, think about what can I do to get my score up, to get to really hitting on all cylinders. If it's an eight to 10, okay, you feel like you got really strong mastery. What can I do to take really great advantage of that? You know, how can I 
how, how can I use that talent that I already have in even more effective ways? If I have a unique selling proposition, I feel really confident about that. What can I do to get that in front of as many potential hiring, hiring managers and influential people as possible? So why are stories important? Why don't I ask you all, you know, feel free, by the way, I like things to be interactive. So feel free to ask questions, to challenge me, to, um, you know, if you're not comfortable coming off mute to ask a question, put in the chat box at any time through this. But let me ask all of you, why are stories important? Crickets. <clears throat> If they resonate with the listener, they're more memorable. Right. And I see Dean wrote, uh, people are more willing to hear a story versus a list of facts. Absolutely. It, it, the story actually, um, it impacts the brain in a different way. It's like our, our, our um, brains suddenly say, oh, story time. And, and they, and, and so, it, it really engages people completely differently. Any other thoughts? It actually shows things that you've done or experiences you've had. Shows things you've done and experiences you've had, yes. Um, also, it, it, it sort of, not impersonalize it, but you and the interviewer are now looking at something in the past and you're sort of collaborating on that. They're trying to find out more, get back to you, and you're speaking to it, but it isn't you. It's that thing you're talking about, that that abstract image. And so you're working with them already in that pursuit. I, I like that. That's a, that's a really good point because it's so important in the interview to be building rapport because you could be on paper, the absolute best person I could possibly hire for this job. You could have all the facts and figures that, that really should make you the best candidate. If I don't like you, if, I, if, if I'm just thinking, wow, you're not gonna fit in with my team, everyone's gonna find you obnoxious, there is no way I am hiring you. On the other hand, if you had just enough in your background that I was willing to, you know, willing to talk to you, then, and suddenly I, I just like your style. I like the way you, you, act, that you talk to me and answer questions. I feel like you're going to have my back. I feel like you're fitting with your, my team really well. I'm going to be making excuses for why the things that I screened other people out for aren't important. Oh, he doesn't, he doesn't have this certification. I can send him to a course. Oh, she, she doesn't, she doesn't have the level of experience in this particular product that I wanted, but you know, I can teach her that. So, so rapport is so critical. And as Elliot was saying, this is a way you're, you're kind of collaborating. You're building that rapport with someone right away. Uh, in fact, I had a client years ago who had been out of work for two full years because she, she got married mid-career. She was like me, I was an actuary. She, she thought, oh, I got my credentials, we're, we'll move up to Boston, I just get another job. And I meet her two years later as she's still struggling. Well, the, what happened ultimately was that someone who, um, who she knew well, who liked her, referred her to her boss who had already ruled her out based on a resume and said, this is the sort of person that you would want on your team. Said, fine, you know, send her in, I'll talk to her. And they hit it off and she hired her on the spot for this director level role. Um, and it worked out really well. I mean, she would, she, I ran into her a couple of years later at a conference. She, she was so happy. The work, the job had progressed so well. So that rapport is really critical. And stories really help you um, bring that to light. 
brand, you know, build that rapport. And I see Earl said stories are a natural way to express meaning. Um, so here's some things I put down on my, on my list. You know, they let you connect on an emotional level. You know, I, I tell you this story, I bring in a situation and we're, you know, we're really connecting in a great way. They show you can communicate, which is so important in anything you do. And these are what make you unique. I can tell you these, you know, qualifications, these facts and figures and so on, but nobody has the stories that I have. Nobody has done the things I've done. So the stories make me unique. And they show how you think and act in certain situations, which is absolutely critical to this employer, to what they're trying to, to figure out if you fit. And they also prove your point, but they prove it in, a, in this engaging way. So a fundamental tenet of, of sales is that every sale is based on emotion and justified by logic. And that is just as true in the interview process as anywhere else. I mean, I, I was a hiring manager. I did all the actuarial hiring for my company for 13 years. And yet actuaries are very logic-based, analytic, but even there, it's very much this rapport and emotion side. I don't go out and buy a red sports car because that's the logical thing to do. I go out because I've, I've always wanted a sports car. Um, I've dreamed of, uh, how I'd be driving down the street and the wind and the hair that I used to have, uh, all, all these things. And once I've crossed that bridge, then the logic side kicks in. I say, well, what's the best deal on the sports car? What's the best maintenance contract? Where's the best dealer that has the greatest service that I can buy it from? So it's the same thing in the interview. Once you get me on that emotional level, then I'm justifying the hire from those, those logical aspects. So the facts and figures, they're the logic side of the equation. The stories are the emotion side. And so the, the home run is when you have really good stories that are backed up by results that sell you. Anyone have any questions so far? Feel free to you know, jump in ask questions at any time. And I'll rely on Dana and Lisa to, uh, if, the, if there's something put in the chat box. Brian, yes, go ahead. Yeah, one, just one real quick clarification, John. I think, I think I'm understanding this now. I had initially come to this presentation thinking you were gonna talk about story and they're the star or the whatever format, situation, action, result form. Sounds like what you're talking about, that's a subset, but you're, you well beyond and above and outside of that, that these are much broader story opportunities. Is that roughly right? Well, we're starting from why you should even tell stories. We will get into a format, um, you know, every, and there are lots of, there's stars, there's pars, there's cars. I have my own variation on it, and I'll, then I'll tell you why when we get there. But uh, we will get into those um, success stories. Um, as as we go along but yeah this is really why are they all important and we're and there's all another type of story we're going to get into too that's really important super thank you john you're welcome so fundamentally what what you want the if you leave this with one point it would be this always leave them wanting to know more so everything you do in your search, you should keep that front and center. You know, in your stories, you're trying to get them excited, get them engaged, wanting to know more about you, wanting to hire you. In your resume, you're trying, it's not, you're not trying to do every detail of your background. You're trying to give them the things that engage them, that make them say, yes, I need to bring Brian in here. You're in your, when you're at a networking event and someone asks you, what do you do? You want a simple one-liner that just focuses on 
a benefit that you bring that gets them wanting to ask more. Now, Allison asked, in what part of the interview do you tell your story? Well, there are two stories that we're going to get into. One is one you'll tell very early in the in the interview. The other, what Brian was talking about, the stars or pars or cars, or in my case, to care stories, those you're actually going to tell throughout the interview. I'm going to advise you that there should be no question it, that you are ever asked in an interview that you do not give a story for. Even if it's just like one or two sentences of a story, because that's what will keep engaging people and leave them wanting to know more. You know, the more detail, the more how you did it, you get into in your story, the less powerful it is. So you really want to focus on what are the elements that are gonna leave someone wanting to know more. So, and then of course, you have to be prepared to deliver. You don't want to get stuck like this after X that they want to know more and you've never prepared for what you're going to say next. So to Robert's point, what, what do you do when they say, tell me a little bit about your background or take me through your resume or any, any variation on that? Now, a lot of people dread this question. In fact, how many on this call, you, you can put in the chat box or, or raise your hand, how many don't like being asked this question? You're uncomfortable about trying to answer it. Usually a lot of hands go up with this. Um, but in fact, this question is one of the best opportunities you have. Because what you get to do when someone asks you this question, they're inviting you to draw the picture that you want them to see. So you're getting a chance to set the stage for how they're gonna look at you. What's the package you bring, at the, bring to the table? Why should they be excited about you? And so this is, a, this is just the best opportunity if you have prepared for it. And, and John, I'm just going to interject for one second. For anyone that's on a phone and can't see the question, John's question is, tell me a little bit about your background. Yes. So let but me. That, but like, yeah, that, right. And that's, but it's also asked differently. Like, can you go through what you, what you were doing? Yep. At your last, <laughs> what's your, what's your, uh, what were your, what were you doing in your last job? And the job before that, like, they don't necessarily ask it like that. But yeah, and well, that's one of the things about the interview, which is one of the reasons you want to do a lot of role play that people, every interviewer is different. Everyone asks different questions. They ask the same question that you've been prepared for, but they ask it a different way or a different time that you haven't thought about and you get thrown off. So, um, yeah, if someone tells me, if they just say, Tell me about your last job. Okay, I'm going to have a story prepared that illustrates what I did in that last job. I'm not going to say, okay, my last job, I was the head of the actuarial department for commercial life, and I did all the reserves, and I did the pricing. I mean, that's boring. I'm going to tell them a story that illustrates what I did in that job, what sort of results I produced, and then say, you yeah, know, would, like would you like me to expand on that? Or would you like me to tell you more? Or would you like me to tell you about my management skills? So I can, I can get them drawing it out. But I am looking for the opportunity to tell my whole story too. So if, if that, you know, if they ask me, for instance, if the first question is, so, or, or very early, why should I hire you? Instead of answering that, just answering that flatly, I'm going to say, well, to, to answer that, I need to tell you a little bit about my background. And now I can tell my, what I call my hero story and I can finish it with a direct answer to that question. So, and that's why you should hire me because I am going to bring X, Y, and Z to your operation. Um, so I can pivot off of many different types of questions that could be asked as an excuse to tell my story 
as long as I make sure that I finish it with a very direct answer to the very specific question they asked. So the hero story. This is and this is just a template I came up with as to a way to tell your story that I found has been very, very helpful to, to my clients. So you start with a headline, just a one or two line explanation of what you are. Because if I don't start somewhere, if I just launch into my story without something at the beginning to anchor it, there's like this, well, where's this going? What's, what's he headed for? What is he about? So I give a headline at the start to give a sense of what I'm all about. Then I go into my experience, but unlike, you know, Robert, when you're saying you tell, you talk about your most recent job, absolutely not. I'm going to go back to the oldest job, not necessarily, this doesn't mean I go back to through every job I've had, because I'm going to decide what's relevant, what's important to my story. But whatever the oldest thing is, I'm going to start there and work my way forward. Because what I'm trying to do is show a trajectory of where I'm headed, how this background supports where I want to go. Um, then I'm going, at, but most importantly, I'm going to throw in some results along the way. Because if I say, well, I was, I was the product disability product manager at Equitable, and then I was the department head at, you know, at Commercial Life, and and then I was the chief actuary. It's like it's boring. It's just telling, and it's not giving a sense of what I contributed. It's just giving a bunch of titles. So I throw in some key results that both make it more interesting and show that I produce results. Then I'm going to get into just a really short bit about what are the rest of the qualifications when I put it all together and I finish with my objective. So the objective, if, if it's a job interview, the objective is probably going to be this job or this job category and this company. Um, if it's the if it's like a networking meeting, you know, one-on-one -on -one networking meeting with someone I don't know where I'm going to tell my story so they get a sense of who I am, then my objective is going to be what's the, the dream opportunity I am looking for? What, where, where do I really want to be heading? And by the way, you know, I put at the bottom, uh, you'll see that on a couple of slides. If you go to my website and you just put in that term in the search bar, it'll bring up... Um, a whole article on the hero story. So <clears throat> let me give you an example. Let's imagine that I've decided that, you know, I'm tired of being an independent career coach, trying to build my business one person at a time. I, I miss the corporate environment. So I've decided I want to go back and be an executive coach at a Fortune 500 company. So the story I might tell, the hero story I might tell would be along these lines. So I'm a, a career coach who helps job seekers who are frustrated with their search and with their career progression overcoming whatever obstacles they face. I graduated from Stanford with a degree in math and economics, and I went into the actuarial profession at Equitable, where I ended up ultimately as a disability income product manager. But the thing that really got me excited was when I was put in charge of figuring out how to measure productivity, which in the 70s wasn't being done in insurance companies, and so we were applying manufacturing techniques to measure and demonstrate and improve our productivity, which led us to win the first ever corporate-wide productivity improvement contest. And everyone in my 150-person uh, department got a $3,000 bonus as a result. I was then recruited by Commercial Life to build an actuarial department from scratch. So for the next 13 years, I did all the hiring, the mentoring, the coaching, the career development for the entire actuarial group. 
Along the way, I was given charge of a non-actuarial group, our compliance department, that they had a manager who basically retired on the job. And they were very frustrated. People were getting ready to leave. And so I went in and reorganized what they did and how they did it, brought someone else in. And in the course of two years, they got to where they were handling 60% more projects without any increase in headcount. And they were really excited about what they were doing. In fact, they were recognized as one of the most productive operations in our company. I then decided I, I needed a change. I, I wasn't ex as excited about the detailed technical work anymore. I love the people side of things, um, and, but I wasn't ready to go start this practice. So what I did was I opened a uh, systems consulting practice, helping companies make their, sure their systems are doing what they're supposed to. Earned over two and a half million in revenues, but on the side, I was starting to coach people on career search and all different aspects of that. And after five years, I finally said, this has been calling me. So I opened my coaching practice. And for the last 20 years, I have been helping people land the job and pay they deserve. Now, when I put it all together, I think I really understand the corporate culture, having worked on both sides of the aisle and as a consultant, um, I, I really understand the, the dynamics. I know how to engage and persuade people. I've mentored and developed staff on a regular basis. And that's what I'd love to do in your company. I'd love to come into a place like this and help your executives and your, your aspiring executives become and be seen as influential leaders. So what stood out for you in that story? Did it engage you? Was it, was it interesting? Any thoughts? Or is, it, is everyone trying to talk on mute? I'd say, John, the results um, really stood out. <clears throat> what you delivered in the past job would be interesting to me as a hiring manager to see what you could do for me. Mm -hmm. Now, I worked as an actuary for well over 20 years. How much actuarial work did I describe? Basically, zero. I didn't hide that I was an actuary, but what I did was I picked out the aspects of what I did that might be relevant to this hiring manager for the next job, that might be relevant to what I want to do going forward. I'm not going to get into the financial stuff I did, the reserving, the analytics, um, unless someone wants to know more. Okay, I can I can talk about that. But I'm so what I'm doing is I'm pulling out the things that are relevant to my story. And I try tried to present, I guess Ken agreed with me, a few clear results. Because if you don't have results, if you don't tell if your stories don't have results, I'm wondering how important what you did was. So this both shows results that make it interesting and relevant, but also shows that I understand the value of my work. And as, as I was saying, I made sure the results were related to what I want to do next. They weren't about actuarial things that I'd done, although I had lots of stories I could bring out about those if I needed to. They were about you know, productivity improvement and mentoring and, and engaging and, and um, corporate development sort of things. So what I'd like to do is get someone to volunteer to tell us their story so we can give you some feedback on how to make it even more engaging. And even if you, you don't feel like you have a good story, at least you can bring out some bullet points and we can help you with how to, how to shape it. And I, and I know you're all sitting there saying, oh, don't call on me, don't call on me. But this is where you get the most value in any of these workshops. Uh, I've many times had a client who said, you know, I don't, I don't know that I need to do any role play because I'm pretty good at that. I said, that's fine. You know, let's tell me 
what would you say if I asked to you to tell me about your background? And then they start stumbling and they're like, oh, wow, you're right. I need help. So this is where you really get the most out of any of this. So who, what brave soul is willing to raise their hand and share their story? Oh, Brian, right away. Yeah, well, I hate that I'm doing this. And you, I'm really, you, you I'm you really beat, good at this. This is out of my comfort zone. And you beat you beat Elliot out by just a fraction there. <laughs> Public speaking is one of the ten worst things that can happen in your life. It's right up there with divorce, apparently. So here I go. So <laughs> okay, great. Uh, so what do you want? The fifteen second version, or how long, John? Well, I if you can tell your whole story in fifteen seconds, <laughs> more power to you. Um, you, know, you just have to talk really fast. But uh, I, my guideline for the hero story uh, is that you, for regular stories, you never want to go longer than a minute. But for your hero story, you got a little bit more material you need to work in. So my guideline is you can go up to about two minutes. If you go more, much more than that, the, uh, the other person is starting to check out or you've tried to cover too much ground and they're not going to remember it. Um, so anything up to two minutes. So I'm a financial analyst and finance manager. I help small companies run their finances, call it CFO, call it accounting lead, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I started out out of college uh, working for KPMG, understanding how businesses worked, went into banking for a while to understand better how companies raised money and what they needed to do for that. Uh, I was able to complete IPOs for a couple of dot coms back in the era when everybody wasn't losing money on them. And I've spent the past couple of decades working for small companies, helping them grow. Uh, particularly, I'm finding more need and opportunity and excitement in technology and clean tech renewable energy sectors. And that's what I'm looking for right now. That's the shortest I've on that and I'm sure there was very little content but I wasn't thinking because I was terrified so please go ahead oh that's that's fine no we we should we should give you a hand for volunteering <laughs> <laughs> I get the participation ribbon that's it. thank the you participation I appreciate that. it's about all I earn okay so before I step in what you know who who has thoughts for what Ryan could do to make that more engaging Or did anything stand out for you in that story? Come on, come on. So everybody thought it was great. Absolutely. Okay, I'll coach all of you then. Not. <laughs> Are you asking me to wake up after that, Brian? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Dean and I know each other fairly well, so he probably took a nap the minute I went off mute. T tough audience. Again, I would say you didn't sound confident because you said "us" and "um" type of things. Thank you, Cheryl. Makes sense. And one suggestion is for word choice, use private companies instead of small, because you said small a few times and it diminishes value. I think with those two things, one, you mentioned IPOs, what kind of size and yeah. what in terms of how you went the back, one or two little thematic blurbs is to IPOs of X resulting in Y. Um, with mm -hmm. small, when small business isn't a bad thing in terms of startups, whether you've grown them or have sold them or whatnot, it's giving an example of one or two to demonstrate some of the work that can add more context to the story. Yeah, I, I would agree. But the metrics and the context really help. So yeah, if you'd said, if you'd given an ex <laughs> like even just the size range of the IPOs, that would have made that pop more. And you did say something about helping them grow in the last couple of decades. So if you threw, that would have been a perfect place to say, for example, and you give a really concrete example of taking a company from X to Y. If you're, whatever story you tell, if you Good tell know, it John, confidently, you. if you're smiling, if you're looking at us, you're, it'll be way more effective. In fact, I, I was doing a workshop on marketing messages one time. And I was, I was giving them the bad example and the good example. And in the bad example, I, you know, I was like smiling and, and I, 
and da 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 da. And someone in the back said, "I'd buy." And I'm like, "Oh wow, that's that's that just showed me how much more, how much power there is to the way you present. If you present confidently and smiling, even a lousy message or a lousy story can still be." effective because I've left with this impression of you. But if you tell a great story and you're smiling and you're confident, just think how, how, how much more effective that will be. John, quick note. Um, one of the folks mentioned ums and ahs and another person mentioned not enough detail and some of the things, even though I was trying to be quick because I rarely am. It occurs to me, <laughs> matters, doesn't it? I'm sorry, you're, the, if something blipped as you said something matters it yeah practice oh yes practice yes it, it does and I, and one thing i would i would also practice is your opening because i i think you're opening you because we called on you it's you know you're not prepared so it's natural but that was that was one that was a little weaker you know um because you were kind of fumbling with what's what am i going to open this with um, so you might go back to the recording and see what you said. Uh, the, the one thing I remember is you said something about run their finances. Now, if you said, if you made that more results oriented about help their finances go from here to there, now that would, that would sharpen them up, sharpen that up a lot. Um, the so first impression would be not something operational, but something beneficial, what I'm going to do for the person I'm interviewing with. Thank yeah. You. You could have the operational part in it as long as you bring the beneficial, the benefit or the challenge you're going to solve into it, because that's what makes the that headline or, or opening really pop when I hear um, a result you might produce. Um, any, anyone else have any other thoughts for Brian? Just one thought. <clears throat> I think that the context makes a lot of sense to put the information more in context. I also think if you could connect it to the job you're interviewing with. So you might give an example, like I did X, Y, and Z. And the reason why I think that's important for this role is because I know you're going to need somebody who can do that sort of thing. I think with an example and then connecting it to the job can make it even more powerful. Yes. Yeah, so you ended just giving a kind of a category, clean tech and energy. So if you ended it with, you know, like Ken saying, link it together and and what are you going to do for the company, the clean tech or energy related company? What are you gonna, what's the sort of value you're gonna bring at the very end that would make that ending a lot stronger? Hey John, um, even though um, it would extend your introduction, how about something personal to end it with something relatable? Like what, what do you have in mind, Dean? Well, I end mine uh, with, I've had the fortunate opportunity to learn many uh, project management uh, tools, such as Agile, Waterfall, Scrum, and Six Sigma. And something fun about me, John, is I have a Kanban board in my garage for the restoration project of a 53-year-old car. I mean, it's, I'm not sure. Because it, it's 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 interesting, but it kind of takes me off track. That um, so it's kind of where's the person going to go? Are we now going to get into a, talk, a discussion of your Chevy? Um, now, in the right context, that would be really powerful. If you know that this person has an interest in cars, if they yeah. you see something in the background that's a you know picture of a jalopy or something like that then it could be really powerful. Um, I remember, you know, Marty Latman loves to tell the story about an interview he had with a CEO. And he was told, you're, he's going to drill you. You're only going to have a few minutes. And after like this third question that the guy was drilling him with, Marty said, I'll answer that in a second. Can I just, I just have to ask, is that a, a, a real, well, I forget what it was, Joe Namath helmet, what is something to do with you know, football. And the guy said, yeah, it is. And they spent the next 40 minutes talking about football and got hired. Um, so in the right context, it would work really well. I'm not so sure about finishing the story that way, though. It feels a little disconnected to me. 
don't know what it, what experience have you how has that worked for you uh, my last interview which was last monday ran for an hour and 45 minutes because we started talking about cars good hey you hit the right, definitely hit the right person with that okay so what if it never comes up and i i kind of referred to this before that almost any question you can you can use as an excuse to tell your background because what i'm what i'm trying to do really is draw this picture because at the very beginning the interviewer or the hiring manager is wondering okay what is elliot what am i buying what it you know should i there's there's some tension there so by telling my story i get the chance to show him what i think i want to communicate and he can relax a little bit or she can relax a little bit. They say, okay, I got, I got an idea of what Elliot is. Now we can, we can dig into the details. We can, you know, kind of fill in the gaps as opposed to for the next 10 minutes, the, the interviewer is still drawing the picture themselves from scratch. And the delivery is critical. Well, you, know, you wanna make sure you know what your story is, but once you're done, tear up the script. Because if, if I tell that story and I basically got it memorized, it's not going to be effective. It's going to come across as this robotic memorized thing. So when I tear up the script and it comes out a little bit differently every time I tell it, it keeps it fresh for me and it's, and it's much more effective. And if you're struggling... You know, you say, you know, this is, I can't remember all the points, then just shorten it. In fact, I, I've done, it, done this with 30 second pitches. Someone who is really struggling to get a whole 30 second pitch out, smiling and co confidently and without stumbling, I say, cut it to one line. Just give one line that you can deliver confidently and smiling and sit down and you will stand out. And when you get really good at that, add a second line. So take the same approach here, right? You know, start out with a little whole story you might want to tell, but if you're struggling with it, go for the shortest version you can and then start expanding on it as you get more effective at it. So let's move into accomplishment stories. It's, um, so this is like stars, cars, pars, whatever you want to call them. Um, these are your talking points for both interviews and networking. Now, don't forget in networking, it's basically mini interviews. You're trying to get people engaged to help you in your search. So you're gonna tell them simple accomplishment stories too. These are how you equip contacts to engage others on your behalf. These are the source of the powerful bullet points in your resumes. In fact, you know, the, you, you can start with the stories and then boil them down to bullets, or you can start with start with simple statements and then expand them and then make them more powerful. But these are the sources of all those points. So what are the critical elements of any accomplishment story? Um, now, you know, we've all you've probably all heard stars, pars, cars, whatever. That's that's fine. It boils down to these three elements challenges, actions, and results. The results could be for the employer. If it's a consultant, it's results for your clients. It might be results for your prospects. It might be results for your internal customers. Um, and if you put in that search term on my uh, website, it'll bring up a number of articles around challenges and the importance of, of weaving them in. Part of the reason I came up with my own to care template, and the two just stands for title overall, because you want a simple title that helps you remember your stories. Ah, this is this is my this is my negotiation story. This is my um, public speaking story. Whatever it might be, so it so you can categorize them and, and recall them easily. But what I've seen, you know the there's nothing wrong with the, the stars and pars and cars um, templates. It's just that what I've seen in the way people tend to put them together is the part that they emphasize the least 
is the challenges. They tend to talk about the situation without getting deeply into the challenges of, of the story. And between in these three elements, obviously results is the most critical. The second most critical is the challenges. And the challenges are what help the results to pop. The least important part of the story is the actions. So let me give you an example. And this is a real example. Um, someone in a workshop I was doing on, on storytelling. This is the story she told. Excuse me. I assumed the operation of a 12-year-old actuarial recruiting business. I had no training and faced a number of technical hurdles. The presentations had to be made via finicky fax machine. There was no online candidate database. Any time a job order came in, I had to pour over a thousand hard copy resumes to find potential candidates. So I set out to create and populate a database with 12 years of candidates, updating their status through internet research, and within a year, I had converted it to an MS Office application and designed an integrated website that allowed candidates to search and apply for jobs and employers to submit job orders online. The result was that we got the time to source candidates down from hours to minutes. Everything is set up with the data on very easy to use multi-purpose Excel files. The website globalizes our business and provides a really professional image. And I set it up for a seamless transition if I should leave or add to staff. So what do you think? Did, did this grab you? What, what do you think about that story? I may have missed the challenge. To me, it sounds like it's a, uh, she's a doer. Mm -hmm. Very much so. She, she jumped right in and, and revise things and set up the set up things in a, a better way, made it more efficient. One of the, one of the things I love about that story, by the way, is uh, let me go back the ending, that last statement. What do you think about what do you think about that last statement that that I set it up for a seamless transition if I should leave or add to staff? That's beautiful. I mean, she's basically given them essentially a, you know, you can use me for other things. I, I've solved your problem and others now can take care of it. What's Absolutely. Next? What's next? Who would you want to hire more than someone who's capable of doing that? Um, and who has the confidence to do it? Because a lot of people are afraid to set things up so that they can be replaced because they're afraid they will be replaced. But in fact, um, the person who is of most value to me is the person who sets things up so that I can replace them. I can put them to, in another role to do exactly the same thing for this other part of the operation. So just, just the confidence to say that speaks volumes about this person in my mind. In fact, um, I told you about that systems consulting practice I had. Well, right from the start, I was I was setting things up so that others could take it over, and I, and I was I was strongly encouraging them. That, you know, I can train other people to do these things. I ended up having full time work from that client for five years, and then after I started my coaching, they came back and said, "Can you help us with this one little thing?" So that I've actually done a little bit of consulting for them for another 15 years. And all along, I'm like, hey, let me show you, show others how to do this. Let me, let me set it up so, you know, so you don't need me. And that was part of the value that I brought to the table. So one thing to remember, every single statement in your resume and your cover letter is an invitation for a question. You know, I, that, that bullet from 15 years ago that you had as a throwaway in your resume, I might ask you a question about that. So have a story to back it up. If you don't, 
I'm going to be sitting there saying, well, that's interesting. Did, did Dana make this up? Does she not, does she not remember what she did? So when you don't have something to back up a point in your resume, you suddenly, I suddenly start to question other aspects of your resume just because you don't have something for that. In fact, a funny story. I, uh, I think I t- told you about this, Dana. That, yes, yes. Uh, a friend of mine, is, he was coaching some uh, master's students at Columbia. And one of them showed, showed him a resume and he's looking at it. And he asked her a question about one of the points and she's fumbling. He goes, what's going on? I, you, you, you don't have a, you can't back this up. She goes, well, actually I didn't do that. My husband did it, but it was something that sounded really good and I needed it in my resume. So I put it there. Oh my God. <laughs> so, um, so you knew this was going to come up. Who would like to tell us about their proudest accomplishment so we can help you make your story even more powerful. I'll give you one quick example, which illustrates not everything has to be work-related either, just has to point to important skills. I found myself in charge of the uh, a developing um, an infrastructure plan for our schools. And we needed to get our town to vote to raise their taxes to pay for a $10 million expansion of the schools. And I created, uh, with my wife, a grassroots coalition, Somerville Cares, to go out and get people to vote. And we were presenting to every place we could. We were presenting to the borough council. We were presenting to the schools. We were presenting in coffees at people's houses. And the night before the uh, the vote, my one of our strongest supporters, a former mayor in the town, he finally he said to me, "I have to admit, I never thought you had a chance of getting Somerville voters to vote to raise their taxes." Now he'd never give in any sign that he had any qualms, any hesitation about it at any point in the process, but he's finally admitting that he never thought we had a chance. And that referendum passed by a 50% margin. That That is a major coup. Nobody wants a tax increase. Yeah. Kudos. So so that would be something I would tell if I was trying to you know talk about my, it might be about presentation, might be a demonstration of engage, engaging a community, you know, it's not a, it's not something that happened in work. It's something outside, which is your stories can be from anywhere. Your stories can be from volunteer initiatives you took on. Your stories could be from how you managed your household. Those are all great as long as you bring them together in a way that demonstrates skills and qualities that will be important to the job. So who would like to try giving a, a story about one of their proudest accomplishments. Diane, you want to volunteer? Yeah, I have a story. Great. When I was at, uh, when I took a position in Citibank in Stanford, they quickly transferred us to uh, New York. And I, I, I was just finishing my undergraduate degree. And I, I said, I can't go. They said, we'll work it out, don't worry. So I went into New York. And another department picked me up, investor relations. It turned out to be one of my the very best jobs I ever had. I was there for almost 12 years. And when I walked into the department, a phone kept ringing, but no one was picking it up. And so um, I started picking it up and it was the investor line. And I really couldn't answer their questions, but I, after 10 or 12 years, I built very strong relationships with all the high-end investors. And uh, it, they, it was really wonderful. I mean, I, ha- I liked doing it. I did more, of course. We released earnings in investor relations. You must all know that. But, um, mm-hmm. and, there, and we would have a chairman's dinner four times a year, which I was in charge of. But my biggest accomplishment there is that I took that over and they let me. Nobody wanted to do answer that phone. <laughs> and and all, all the people, all the, all the um, Merrill Lynch's and 
Goldman Sachs, they knew that uh, I would get back to them. And their administrators would call and we would have, I uh, organized a luncheon for the administrators and they thought that was the best thing in the world because they were coming to lunch at Citigroup. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that, that's it only, you know, I guess I have more stories, but it depending, depending on the. Now what, what, what I would think about in that one, I think you've got a lot of elements, lot, kind of a lot of moving parts. I'd break that down into multiple stories. So I, I, I love th that picture of you're walking in and the phone is ringing and you eventually came back to that. I would make that a story right up on itself that you know, I walked into this investor relations area first day, the phone's ringing, no one's answering. I pick it and so I picked it up and I became known as the person who would always get back to people Correct. Uh, yeah, it is true. Right there. You, you've got me. That's a that's a great story right there. <laughs> um, and then what you did bringing the people in, to, you know, and they all love to come and see it. And, you know, um, that would be another story. So I, I break that into different pieces and you and each one will be more powerful on its own. And you can always say, at the end, would you like me to tell you more about the investor relations or, you know, and the person might now ask you to tell the next part. Also, I was the person to go to if you wanted to sit at, at that time was John Reed at the, at the John Reed's table. <laughs> so, so I would always say we had to take turns. You know, I used to teach kindergarten, uh, kindergarten and nursery school. So that was always a good line, taking turns. So, yeah. which we did. Yeah, that, another, another great example. Yeah. So just, Thank try, you. you know, so think about just, how can I break these up so they so each one has the most impact and they're nice they're nice short nuggets that they bring someone in I say wow that's I mean I want the person who I, I was one of those people too like at, on on the last day of the year the phone would be ringing at four o'clock and it's like oh shoot there's not going to be anyone to you can call on to help but I someone's got to answer the phone and I would do it um and I always, I always appreciated that sort of person who, who wouldn't say, well, someone else is going to ring, let it ring. Someone else is going to get it. I'll, I'll move on. So. I, I went for an interview about two months ago and I'm told by the recruiter, they're still considering me. But one of the questions they asked um, was, um, would I be willing to help other people in the company? So I said, Oh my God, I get in trouble for that. And other, I get, I did get in trouble for that for in other companies because other companies don't want you to help out other departments. But this uh, company was a little different, and um, they seem to interact. Maybe there's 300 people there. Mm -hmm. So if you find find an interest, they said you could go and help them and see if you like that department. Everybody does it. They said so. For me, that's like a, a perfect situation. And, and that's how I responded to it. I said, boy, I get into trouble for, I got, I did get into trouble for that in, in other companies. You know? I might be a little careful about the saying, I got into trouble. Right. Because it's true. Because I might I say, well, I, yeah. <laughs> but saying, look, that's my dream. I mean, companies I've been in, they don't, they, they didn't encourage that. I, that's, you've just right. hit the core of what I'm all about. I love to help people. Yeah, that would thank, thank you. That I, I knew that wasn't the, those were not the right words. It, they came right out of my mouth, but yep. uh, they were genuine. That's for sure. <laughs> yes. So um, rather than since rather than put someone else on the spot unless someone wants to, so what we can just go to Q and A. But I did have two things I wanted to mention. One is um, as as Dana mentioned in the opening, I have a career tips newsletter I put out every month with advice on marketing yourself. So anyone who would like that, uh, just drop me a note or put something in the chat box and I'll ask Dana to give me your email, um, just saying tips and I'll put you on the distribution list for that. And if you do that, I'll also send you that building influence series that, that Ken was mentioning at the beginning. It's just one short email a day for about two weeks 
on everything to do with building influence in meetings, in interviews, in networking. People tell me they get a lot of value from that. Um, I also, I don't have time to do very many, but if you're really interested in um, exploring what it might be like to you know, work on your search, I'll schedule a kickstart your career search session. There's no charge. Um, you fill out this assessment that's at the link there and it'll give you a lot of insights into what's going on in your search that I can share with you in that session. So it's a 30 minute session to zero in on the goals and challenges that you're facing. So no matter what, it's gonna position you to take action. If there's a fit, I'll describe how we can work together on that, but there's no obligation out of this. It's just, you're gonna get a lot of value either way. So the first three who you know, reach out saying they'd like to do a kickstart, I, I'll schedule those. Um, so at that point, why don't we just go to whatever questions people might have that we didn't get to. Hey, John, I just want to just want to make a point. I guess these these stories are basically uh, you want to make these stories brief and to the point, yes. and not get too wrapped up in the detail of your responsibilities, but really touch on your responsibilities, but wrap a story around it, and and just move the story forward. But don't get all wrapped up in the weeds of, of what you do and all that kind of stuff. Just wrap the story, touch on the responsibilities and move forward with the next story. Is that yes. kind of absolutely because you can um you can get into the weeds when the person is excited and they say, okay, tell me how you did that part. Tell me about this aspect of the story. So at that point they re they really want to know. But if you throw them in the weeds during the story you're reducing the engagement there you're likely um you're likely going a lot further than they care to go at that point yeah. um and the more you can make a story think about what's the one point i really want them to get from this story this is this this about my presentation skills is this about my financial savvy is this about my leadership is this about my project management and think, what can I tell that's specific to that? So you might have a story, like that story I told about the, um, the grassroots coalition of the vote. Depending on the conversation I'm having, I might only tell part of that story, or I might tell, a diff tell it a different way because this particular person is more interested in finance, or this person is interested in marketing, or the question they've asked is focused on this particular aspect. So the more, you know, the more focused it is, you can always come back to that later on when they ask about another aspect. You say, well, you know that story I told you, well, we also did this. Right. And try to keep them to no more than a minute. You wanna keep them um, where it's absorbable and memorable. And I found that when you go more than a minute, you're usually filling it up with more of the weeds. You're filling it up with missile, with extraneous stuff. So it kind of using that as a guideline forces you to keep them compact enough that they're that they're interesting. Hey John, I, I have a quick question, and, and that's uh, um, my my last role at J.P. Morgan Chase. I was a software engineer, and part of the work. Um, uh, it was a kind of voluntary. We 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 had taken play. We had taken part of hackathons where mm -hmm. we where ideas yep. were, were were shared, and we participated in committees. Um, one of the committees I got involved with was looking at exploring ideas of using credit card a, 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 a credit card disablement and what kind of concepts were. And we had a couple of discussions and everything. Um, two years two years later, a patent was issued. Uh, from from the discussions, mm -hmm. um, it's not directly related to my work, um, but but there's aspects of saying creativity in terms of the engineering or problem solving. H how would you approach that um, to use that as an accomplishment? Well, there's nothing wrong with uh, saying that you know this this work that I that I did and the hackathon that we were putting together it ultimately led to the company getting a patent. 
because it did. So, so you can you can include that as a result for your story. Uh, I've included stories before that, you know, okay, maybe what I did didn't necessarily, um, I can't point to something, this great result right here, but I know that the company took the technique that I use as a template for every future project. Okay, that's a result that the company used, my work became a, a template for the future. If sometimes with, um, it's, hey, I left, I don't know the result. I don't, I don't know what happened. I, I wasn't there anymore. Well, then it can be, what was your, what based on the project plan that you put together, based on where it was at that point, what would you have anticipated it? You know, based on the plan, here's what it should have done. Um, or sometimes you're in something and, and they cancel it. Okay, you know, I don't know what happened. You know, it was on track to do this. Unfortunately, the company decided to, you know, to go in a different direction. But I still have the result of where it was going based on my work. Any other questions about stories or anything else? Two quick questions. It's the end of the interview. Feel it went well. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it was a pleasure, blah, blah, blah. When you're on your way out, what can one say? One suggested let them know you're, you know, you're enthusiastic about that, but you know, next steps or whatever. But how do you want to leave them? That's one question. And and the other one is before that point, when they say so, John, do you have any questions? In asking the question, hopefully about their company, you've done some research, is it wise to wed any part of your earlier story because such and such, blah, 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 I was wondering, blah, 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 or just leave it in the abstract? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Thank you. Well, there's a whole, I, I mean, I do a whole presentation on, on okay. interviews and, and one aspect of it is what do you do at the end? Um, the short answer to the end is if you've asked good questions throughout, the, don't, don't strain to try to come up with a great question at the end. Um, but what you want to make sure you do is you, you want to, there's, there's three things you want to do. One is you want to find out, find out where you are, find out how you did. So you want to ask a question related to that. Like, so is there anything else I could tell you that would convince you I'm the person you want to hire for the job? Ah. You say it in a very, you know, a lot of, you, you, you hear a lot of people saying something like, well, is there anything that would prevent you from hiring me? Absolutely the wrong question to ask because that's inviting the person to dig deep and find a reason not to hire you. So you ask it in a very positive way. What else could I tell you? Um, and then you watch the reaction. And if there's any hesitancy or they share something that, you know, yeah, you could tell me about this, answer it right there as best you can. Try and try and walk away with them, you know, now saying, yeah, you are, you are a very good candidate for this. Second thing is you want to find out what are the next steps? What's, what's the timeline? What are the next steps? Third thing is, well, and in that process, um, make sure you know, let, that you basically ask for the job, that you, that you let them know you are very interested because I don't want to, if I'm the hiring manager, if Elliot's come in to interview and it's absolutely clear he wants a job and Dean's come in to interview and I'm just not sure and they're pretty comparable I'm going to make the offer to Elliot every time because I know he's going to accept it. Now, it doesn't mean you're saying, I am going to accept this job no matter what. It just means saying, wow, this is, you know, based on everything you've told me, this is a really exciting opportunity because I think I can bring X, Y, and Z to the table. Is there anything else I can tell you that would convince you that I'm the person you should hire? So, I, so I've made sure that they know I'm very interested at the same time that I'm finding out how we did. And then the last thing is set yourself up for your own action step. They tell me 
Well, we're going to make a decision. We anticipate looking at three more people in the next two weeks, and then we'll make a decision. I say, great. So I will plan to follow up with you two weeks from Monday if I haven't heard from you by then. So now I can go home, mark my calendar for two weeks from Monday. I'm not spending the next two weeks obsessing about what I haven't heard. When am I going to hear? Should I call them? What's going on? Because I've already set it up. And I've shown them that I am a professional who's organized, who's, you know, I've marked my calendar. And, and a lot of times you don't hear when they said they might tell you because it took longer to schedule people, whatever. So when I call two weeks from Monday and I say, Elliot, I'm just following up. I'm very interested in that project manager role we spoke about. Um, sorry, I missed you. I will plan to call you again on Wednesday to see where we stand. Now, you're going to you're going to answer. You're going to you know, get your voicemail and say, oh, wow. Yeah, he said he was going to call today. He did. So you've just demonstrated a quality that might make it more likely that I hire you because I say he he follows through on what he does. He's organized. He's following. He's professionally persistent. I, I want to be respectful of everybody's of time, especially yours, John. You said 11, that you're going to speak to 1130. So, so thank you so much. I mean, this was really wonderful. It was. Sure everybody learned it. Yeah. <laughs> Please feel free to unmute yourself and really and show your appreciation to John. It was really wonderful. Yeah, John, this is great. Learned Thanks a lot of that. things. Excellent. Thank you. I'm thank you, John. Found it helpful. Much. Great talk. Good luck to everyone that has those interviews today and, and anytime soon. Very helpful.